Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be here today. It's my first time at Baltic State Technical University, and I'm very impressed with the hosting and the wonderful history of this institution. It's also my, I've been now with the Heinrich Center in an adjunct position for five years, and it's been a real privilege to work with the excellent staff, the researchers, the great students, and to be engaged in an opportun opportunity to converse across the Norwegian Russian national boundaries, but also across the fields of politics, business, and science. Today, I'm going to talk a bit about the Arctic politics more generally. I think we've all noticed that we're often presented with either or statements about the Arctic. It's either the new Cold War or the hot cooperative Olympics. It's either boom or bust. It's globalize the Arctic Council or defend the Arctic Five. There can be a scramble for territory or it's a grindingly slow legal process at sea. The Arctic is often the last wilderness or the economic treasure chest for the future. You know, the Arctic is an important place in the Western imagination. From the days of Greek philosophers who dreamed about Ultima Thule, the beyond the edges of the known world, to the search for riches and glory in exploration and empire, through to today's preoccupations about national energy security, climate change, and how to truly recognize the Arctic as a set of indigenous homelands. So in some, the Arctic is an inspirational and contradictory and interesting place, and it does inspire hyperbole, and it inspires either-or thinking, often in the land of media and expert country. Now, as a student of Russian politics, a citizen of an Arctic country, the USA, although some may argue that Wisconsin is far too far from Alaska for me to make that statement. And having lived in Norway for the past decade, I can observe that these, these binaries, these either or classifications in public debate are quite widespread in the Arctic. In today's brief comments, my aim is to present two questions that I think can help us in cutting across these popular binaries about the Arctic. So as researchers, our task should be to create new accounts and approaches that take into consideration the broad range of structural, geographic factors, actors, and interests at play in the region. And I'm presenting questions rather than presenting findings today because taking advantage of the fact that we're all here to discuss cooperation and to discuss next steps, and hopefully this will be one opportunity. The questions I pose, one about the nature of science and science diplomacy, and one about the future and how we cope with it, are based, relate to my research, and I'm happy to talk to anyone in more detail after. But this especially relates to how climate science is understood in policy circles, and on responses and experiences of communities in the Arctic that experience the anticipation of Arctic oil and gas projects without those projects being realized. So there's a project that asks, what does a company corporate social responsibility look like then? But turning first to the question of science and expertise and the policy role of scientific production. Well, we heard this morning that, for example, for Norway, one of the major goals is knowledge production. And the Arctic has long been a place for cooperative scientific ventures from the first international polar year in 1882. Arctic scientific cooperation remained an important touchstone of contact even at the height of the Cold War, and even between the two <coughs> opposing superpowers of the United States and the Soviet Union. We have examples of this. Today, we see that the Arctic Council and other types of bilateral cooperation have produced state-of-the-art scientific assessments of the Arctic environment. We know from international relations studies in other regions and other policy fields that the networks of scientists who participate in these international efforts have a role in policy development in their, um, in their national settings. They can help develop a common understanding of cross-national problems. And also we see that they often present or promote the use of policies, of assessments in policy. As we know from, I have a friend who is a, a doctor, and he informed me that at least in the US, 70% of prescriptions given to patients never get filled. No one ever cashes them in. And I have to say that I think probably in the knowledge policy connection that the ratio might be similar. But we produce a lot of good research, good assessments, but the question of how it enters into policy and how it can actually make an impact 
is something where we really have a ways to go. So knowing these things, here are some of the questions. As the range of countries and other actors interested in Arctic governance continues to grow, to what extent and how should these countries be brought into existing Arctic networks and projects? To what extent and how can Chinese, Korean, Japanese, and other nations' polar science be further integrated into the long history of international scientific cooperation in the Arctic? As I mentioned earlier, we still know far too little about the policy uptake of collectively produced Arctic scientific work. How do scientific exercises like the Arctic Marine Shipping Assessment gain attention in Arctic states, in China, in the USA, and in non-Arctic international forums where Arctic-related questions are debated? So that's also picking up on Eric Sievertson's point this morning that the Conference of the Parties in Paris will be the most important Arctic meeting of the year. How will Arctic science be doing? Finally, we need to ask the question of could the knowledge produced be better suited somehow to local and national policy actors? We know that current projection information in the natural science side, for example, related to climate, is often too broad in terms of its spatial and temporal resolution for many local, city level, and regional policy actors. So, in sum, I think we have an inter there would be fertile ground for further research on how Arctic science has policy impact in a growing range of diverse settings. There are key lessons and findings to be researched about how we organize upstream scientific production, issues of who is involved, how is the team set, focus, and process, but also very much downstream reception. It's not just about knowledge production. We need to know more about how it's picked up and used. Now, Anatoly set me up perfectly for this second broader question about the future and how, even though we can't know it, the future is definitely perhaps our most kind of intensive and dynamic policy actor. It's what we're working towards. It's what we're always on the cusp of. And we know that in the Arctic, since the early 2000s, there's been increasing international attention to and at times great enthusiasm about the possibility of a surge in large scale natural resource extraction in the Arctic. If you're just a casual reader of media in Arctic countries, you might have even thought that the northern sea route was already challenging the supremacy of the Suez, that the Stockman gas field in the Barents was already up and running, or that Chinese companies were already mining Greenland's vast mineral wealth. These, this one scenario, the Arctic boom scenario, has very much dominated the regional agenda in the public debate. But however, the important question to ask is how prepared are Arctic communities, Arctic states, and broader international stakeholders to engage in sustainable development policy making in the absence of such major development opportunities. This is, I'm speaking now to a project that, that Nupi and Nurland have developed and submitted to the Nordic, uh, Nurforsk, the Nordic Ministerial Research Council, which we hope you will be prominent. Because here we're asking a set of questions about how scenario thinking can assist in policy making exercises. Can Arctic stakeholders be engaged in the creation of durable, evolving policy stances that prepare communities and countries for futures that are outside the superficial caricatures of either boom or bust? Our argument is that all levels of Arctic governance need to be prepared to meet many, many futures. The future is both what we make it, but it's also there's not just one Arctic, there are many, there are probably many possible futures for these different Arctics. Would one way of sensitizing Arctic policymakers to relevant uncertainties and risks be via a participatory scenario exercise? If we think about policy implementation and governance more as the science of muddling through, where you were trial and error, rely on past experience, and often proceed incrementally, a multiple adaptable scenario approach could pay dividends. But just to wrap up, those of us who live or research or work in the Arctic region know that there are a lot of shades of gray. Yes, we had Stockman fever and it passed, but that doesn't mean that the Arctic economic future is bleak. Yes, the geopolitical and geoeconomic situation following Russia's actions in Ukraine is complicated and worrying. Yet, the Arctic ecosystem still stubbornly cuts across national boundaries, 
And we also have the legacy of over two decades of region building, of joint education programs, shared nature management, and Arctic military top brass who check in with each other on Skype every week. This forces us to see again and again that either or statements about the state of Arctic politics just don't cut it. And here is where political science and researchers have an important contribution to make in capturing and distilling the complexity of the region, drawing research-based conclusions, and making them somehow as catchy as the either or binaries I opened the brief comments with. So I think very much again the organizers, uh, the hosts, and all the speakers thus far today. I found it to be very enjoyable events. Thank you.